Our first speaker this morning is Holly, Holly Irvine. And as you all know, Holly is ALN's national president. And one of the things that, that has been on my mind a lot recently is that we know all of the things that people do professionally. Holly works for Wellstar. She's done a number of things. She started out as an OR tech and has moved up through the ranks. She is the daughter of an OR nurse that you all know, Ann Medlin. But some of you may know, a lot of you may not know, but I'm from Villaroca and Douglasville, which is, uh, Holly lives in Villaroca. She grew up in Douglasville. I was born in Villaroca. I grew up in Douglasville. My mother is a rural letter carrier, I was when she was working, and Holly was on my mother's mail route. So my mother still to this day asked, How's Ms. Medlin and the Adorn? Because she saw the ALN journal every every month when she delivered it to Holly's house. And she says, Oh, I went by Ms. Medlin's and we went to the same church. Went by Ms. Medlin's and let the Adorn journal today. And I said, No, no, mother, it's not ALN, Adorn, it's ALN. So we all have connections that are have sustained us through the years and acknowledging that and thanking people is something that I think that we should do. Holly is uh, going to talk about advocacy and the importance of the partnership with ALN today. We all, all of us who've been around for a long time know how important that is. And I think as newer people come in and come up, you also need to realize how important that connection is and how far the reach is, not just in the United States, but around the world because we have this village that is perioperative nursing. So, Holly, please come up. Good morning. How are y'all? Um, so, as Brenda said, I have been in and around AORN for my what seems like my whole life. Um, Mom joined back in the 70s and has attended every, well, I call them Congress, every Congress or Expo since she joined except for one. Um, one year she decided to go to OR manager and let some of her staff go to ARN's meeting. So she's missed one over the years. And, you know, when she, what do you mean? They couldn't hear me. That's kind of scary. Can you hear me now? I'm going to do a Verizon commercial. Um, and so, you know, we used to, I used to love it when she went to ARM because that meant that all of the parents, all of the husbands, excuse me, and the kids would all get together and we'd go eat pizza. Um, and then I used to love digging through her bag when she would come home of all the goodies. And anybody who's seen me, on the expo floor, you know, I'm just as bad as she is, right? And would love um, Medline because our maiden name was Medline. I was like, look, it's almost our name. I could just cut the E off the end. Um, and what I didn't know then that I know now is all of the work that AORN does for the nurses. Um, it's not, it's, we do talk about our patients and we talk about how we care for our patients. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And I remember as a brand new nurse going down to what's now Piedmont Henry for a Georgia Council meeting. And it was a full Georgia Council meeting, but there's only about seven people around the table. And we talked about what was what we were doing back then, Georgia Council was, was um, trying to get um, legislation passed for a, one nurse circulator um, for every patient in the OR. And, and I will tell you that, and without getting into a lot of history, but we, Georgia Council had spent a lot of money for legislation. And um, we still owed a lot of money towards that um, advocacy that we were doing for for our patients in the state of Georgia as well as for the nurses in the state of Georgia 
an ARN national came in and helped relieve some of that debt. And they also started that fight trying to get, um, trying to work for us, trying to get that legislation passed. We're still working on that, right? Um, but as a perioperative nurse, I have always believed and I've always said, um, my one job as a circulator is that I am the patient's advocate and I am that voice. When the patient doesn't have a voice, I'm that voice. And that was something that, honestly, I learned from my mom. Um, I was a surgical tech, and one of her favorite stories is that um, as a surgical tech, she, um, I came home one day and I said, I don't know what the big deal is. Nurse just sits over there and, and she preps and she writes on the chart, I could do that as a surgical tech. And she said, don't ever let me hear you say that again. And she was like, that, this, the nurse does way more than that. The nurse is that patient's advocate. That nurse is the one who speaks up. And I remember having to speak up for a patient. I remember having to go toe to toe with a surgeon. And um, the patient, there was a, an implant that the physician wanted to use. And I don't know if you guys remember, if, you're, if you've been in the state of Georgia for any length of time, we had a patient um, that passed away from a ACL. It was a young guy. Um, and what they found out in the subsequent investigation is that his um, ligament that they used was not handled properly. And he ended up getting an infection and dying. And so after that, we had a large amount of in-services about the proper way to handle those ligaments and bone and anything else that we're implanting into patient. And one of the biggest things was you have to follow the manufacturer's recommendations for use. How many times have we heard that, right? You manufacturer recommendation for use. So I had the insert and I'm reading manufacturer's recommendations for use. And it said that the implant needed to sit on the back table open for 60 minutes prior to implantation. And I spoke up and said that. And the sales rep almost lost his mind. He goes, he's ready to implant that now. And I said, Ann, I'm telling you what the recommendation for you says. And I said, this is your view. It's not mine. It, it's yours. And he goes, so next thing I know, he's on the phone. This is back before, I mean, we had cell phones, but of course we didn't have good service in the ORs. So he's on my phone in my room calling somebody. And he brings me the phone. This is sales rep. He says, here. I'm like, who is this? This is this is Bob. He's vice president, blah, 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 blah. And I said, that could be your brother for all I know. I said, fine. If, if that's not the correct manufacturer instruction for use, here's our fax number. So put it to me in writing on company letterhead and fax it to me. It's real simple. And so the physician um, was like, you know, what's going on? And so I told him, and of course, he's the captain of the ship. If he wants to implant it, he can implant it. But guess what Holly's going to do? Holly's going to throw out a, an incident report and let people know. And, and I said, you know, it's not that I'm being difficult. I'm, I'm the patient's voice. If that's my mother on the table, I want you to follow the manufacturer's instructions for use. There's a reason why they wrote them that way, right? And so, um, and I mean, if you think about it, ARN writes guidelines, right? We write our recommended practices, our guidelines, whatever you want to call them, position papers. And we do, they're all evidence based. And one of the things that it's going to say is follow the manufacturer's instructions for use. And that's what we have to stand on. And I've, um, the, the physician had come back and we had a long conversation. And I said, you know, it's, and he actually, what was interesting, he actually signed the incident report that he agreed to what it was saying. And I said, you know, it's just that I need to cover myself and I need to cover the hospital. And I said, but I need to speak up for the patient. And another physician heard about it and he said, you know, Holly, why would you do that? And I said, because if we, it comes down, if something were to happen and there's a negative impact to this patient and this were to go to court, the lawyer's going to ask me, Holly, did you know what the insert said? Absolutely, I did. And I told the physician. 
And the second physician said, you would testify against a physician? And I'm like, in a New York minute. <laughs> and he said, I don't think I want you to circulate in my room anymore. And I said, do you know what? That should make you want me to be the circulator in your room because you know that I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to protect the hospital. But the most important thing is I'm trying to protect your patient and my patient. And in that same way, AORN does what they can to protect us. When I was first elected, um, I feel like it's been a hundred years ago because you know we can, we count our our moments, right? And we haven't had a lot of these live moments. Um, and so when it came time to talk about what did you want to do for your theme, the my and when I say that, I firmly believe that my role as a circulating nurse is to protect the patient at all cost. That's the, it's actually a statement at the top of my resume, at the top of my curriculum vitae. It says that. This is my position statement as a circulator. I firmly believe that my role as a circulator nurse is to protect that patient at all costs. And so, and to be that patient advocate. And so when it came time to pick a theme, advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. And, um, my great friend, Missy Merlino, past president, had actually sent me a list of everything that we've ever had in AORN, who the president was, what year it was, where they had um, their expo or their Congress, what, what city we were in. And as I went through and read that list, nobody had ever talked about advocacy. And so, I told um, my story to the team at headquarters and they were like, this is great. I think we, I think this will be a great theme. And the way that we worded it um, and the way that I wanted it was that it's not just about being an advocate for that patient, but it's also about being an advocate for yourself. And it's also about being an advocate for the profession. And so how can we be an advocate advocate for our patient. It's just like the story I told. That's being an advocate for our patient. But how can we be an advocate for ourselves? Well, one of the ways is to sit through your certification, know the recommended practices, guidelines, position statements, know what AORN has to say about those, those various components, and then teach others what those say. When I was a brand new nurse, I had my own copy. And I'm sorry, I keep flipping back and forth. I know that they're the guidelines. I still call them recommended practices. It's what it is. Um, and But I had my own copy of the book. I mean, it was 100 bucks back then, and I paid that $100. And thanks to Clinique having a kit, I had a little vinyl, looked like a little vinyl briefcase. And I carried that into the OR with me every single day. And if... I'm, if I wanted to know what AOR friend said about something, I'd open it up. And then the people kind of started knowing me as the AORN person. And they would come to me and say, hey, Holly, what does AORN say about doing a count? Well, I could usually quote that one. And then, but if it was something I didn't know, like lasers, I'd say, well, let's look it up together. And we would look it up. And we would, you know, we could all better our practice that way. And that was a way that we could advocate for ourselves is knowing and having that knowledge and being able to speak to that knowledge. But how do we advocate for our profession? Well, that was the work that we were doing 20 years ago when I first joined AORN here in the state of Georgia. We were working on that legislation for one circulator for one patient. And I will tell you, over the years of serving on the ARN board, I've had the opportunity, I think two different times, to go and speak at AST and represent AORN at AST. And if you're ever wondering about where your scrub techs stand on them wanting to circulate, go to an AST meeting. You'll find out real quick what, the, what their feelings are. I'm not going to speak to it today. I'm just telling you. 
you can you can listen and you can figure it out. Um, but then how are we doing that today? Here we are 20 years later and we have other legislation that we're trying to get passed because we're advocating for our profession. And it's not just, okay, if we pass this law, it's only gonna be um, good for those AORN members. No, it is for every single healthcare team member that's in that operating room. It's not just about me. And I will tell you that when we did have the opportunity to go to the Capitol and speak to this, and there was a physician who spoke against it, it was very difficult to listen to him. It's like, really? You don't think that those that smoke that's being produced is carcinogen? Car is a carcinogen, excuse me? Or that it's going to impact your health and we're gonna hear later today about how it has impacted one of our nurses here in the state of Georgia, how it's impacted her health. And we have to stand together because one person sounding the alarm is not gonna be heard. Two people are not going to be heard. We as AORN, as Georgia Council, we all have to stand together. We have to work together to get this law passed. And one of the things that we talked about last night with actually some of our vendor partners is that they can help. It's not just our voice. It's not just the healthcare voices. We need other people to stand with us. So if you tell one person and that person tells another person, we need to make sure that the people in our communities know. If you have an opportunity to speak in front of a civic group or in front of a church group and let them know they, they have been behind us during the COVID pandemic and they can continue to stand behind us by going and speaking to the legislators. But we all have to do this together. And AORN is standing right there with us. We have some great legislative workers that um, are in constant contact with the GNA and with Brenda and with Angie and we're trying to get this law passed. They're, they are working with us and they're working for us. And that's really all I got. I, if I wanted to give an opportunity for anybody to ask questions of me, um, I know we'll have all, I'll be here all day. I'm not gonna leave. Braves aren't playing until eight o'clock tonight. <laughs> Game is sold out. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. heard about different hospitals and hospital who are laying off requiring nurses to have the vaccine, even better than working in this situation for over a year and a half, two years. We've done everything we need to do for an N95 or a double mask or whatever. Now all of a sudden, they want to mandate the fire conditions that are laying them off. Mm -hmm. We're having severe shortages now. Everything's a dead sign. A all the big nursing homes. If that area is happening, how are there? What's their stand on that? So I know that the vaccine is recommended. What is their stance for the ANA or CT partner in that in that situation? Oh, I can go. I can tell what the people are. Yeah. So Brenda was trying to give her a microphone so that everybody would hear. Basically what she's saying is um, in this world of COVID and we're, le we're losing healthcare workers because of the mandates to get vaccinated. And she just wanted to know what AORN and ANA stance on it is. And we actually published our stance. Um, I'm trying to remember which month that was. Darlene, you're our secretary. Maybe you help remember which month it was, but we have published our stance and our stance is that healthcare workers need to be vaccinated. Um, I mean, we understand that there are maybe some religious beliefs or there's some medical beliefs um, as to why someone would not get vaccinated, but ARN's position, we signed on, I think it was, we signed on to ANA's position statement that healthcare workers be vaccinated. Mandated, Mandated. yes. Yes, Brenda. 
Thank you, Brenda. Um, and, and you're right, the, the mandates are not, that this, it is not something that is new. Um, but we, I mean, yeah, sure. Thank you for those comments and and i will take those back but um the the way that something like this works just so everybody knows um when ana sends out a request to say we're we're sending this position this is our position would you like to sign on this isn't a decision that's made by headquarters staff it's not a decision that's made by myself we send it out to the entire board and then the board either says we agree or we disagree. And if we agree, then then we sign on to it. And we did sign on to it. Okay, I'll be here all day. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm I'm pretty personable. I'm pretty I'm not standoffish. I'm kind of out there. So anybody that wants to ask me anything, I'm pretty transparent too. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Holly, very much. I appreciate that. All right, just one more Holly story. Uh, <clears throat> we started planning, Georgia Council started planning this conference what, months ago. How long ago? Like first of the year. And so we started trying to think of things for the conference. And, and I had already decided that advocacy was what I wanted. And I called Holly and I said, Holly, what's your, uh, what's your thing going to be for your conference? And she says, well, I'm not going to reveal it to Orla until Orlando. And I said, okay. So we went ahead with this theme, advocacy, advocacy, the heart of perioperative nursing. And then I find out later on, hers really is advocacy. So we had not communicated with each other and ended up at the same point. So, um, that's that is a telling situation to me because it it demonstrates that the same things are in our brains what we care about what is important to us is almost universal across perioperative nursing not just here in georgia but across the united states and the world so our next speaker is going to talk about a, another advocacy topic which holly alluded to and it's surgical smoke Vanjie is probably one of the people who does not need an introduction. Um, I have so many Vanjie stories that we should probably talk about those one-on-one -on -one instead of trying to pick one out and we, you can find us and, and we can do that. She's been a, a Georgia nurse for a really long time. I first met her in, she says 40 years ago. I don't think it was that long ago, but um, we did. We we were doing smoke evacuation at Gwinnett Medical Center. So she does lasers. Uh, she speaks uh, all over the country, all over the world. We've been to Saudi Arabia together. That's another story. And um, more importantly, in the last few years, she's been serving on Aaron's board, and she is going to follow Holly as the next president from Georgia. We could not be happier about that. 
I also want to acknowledge that ConMed is the sponsor of this session, and we have Liam Burns in the back. Did you want to say anything? Stand up so everybody can see who you are. We are very grateful to the sponsors of the sessions and the different the, the break and the lunch with our sponsors because it has allowed us to have this nice venue to do the program this year. So thank you very much, and we're glad to see you here. And Vanji, please come on up. Thank you. I knew after our, our cocktail party last night, I wanted to make sure I get away from that here um, to assure I want to discuss my name. Happy Hanukkah. Just so excited about what this is going to be back in January. It could not be a delivery and quality of education program to support the members. It's a good part of the members. And again, the community of our work is back in. Facilitate us uh, put this wonderful event together. So, well, I'm smoking again, as usual. I'm going to put it together. Well, the advocacy that the comment response for this lecture, let's clear the air. So, a little bit about my history. I wonder if I should turn this mic. Well, let's turn it this way. Um, I'm on the ANSI standards, 136.1 and 136.3, and specifically addresses lasers. I am now president-elect for AMRIO. I am, was the past treasurer. I remember the last uh, presentation I did uh, about a year ago, live on this, and I was doing some numbers, and I, I said, and one and one, I'll give you a hypothetical, one and one equals uh, three. And I went, oh no, I'm the treasurer, and I just added in <laughs> Um, I, was, I was a chair for the American Society for Lasers and Medicine and Surgery. I was on the I am on the International Council for Smoke uh, component of that. I was also the first beta site for the Go Clear. And Brenda was very instrumental with Bayer Ram National in getting uh, establishing the Go Clear and we were the test monkeys. Uh, and it was very successful and that was a community health system where we went go clear and there was a plaque in aid at that time for the ambulatory centers. We were very proud of that. Um, 43,000 cases a year. So it most definitely can get done. Um, the other thing, five major hospital conversions of 35, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. It can be done. We started to get to understand the way hospital system our way from suddenly to a spike station. We we did smoke evacuation there and set up the offices there. And from there, I went to Emory, we went to Coastal Clearwood, then I went to Wellstore, AMC downtown, and South Campus James here for the record. We went smoke free there, we did the plot of the Clearwood. And then I said, you know, I kind of want to just do hospitals and then lay low, read the rules the first 90 days, and get it provided for months of time. They kept saying, we need to go clear. We need to go to here. And I said, okay, we did that conversion. It came all the way to the Vietnamese and talked about smoking the blockers there. And they threw a coke in the same place. And actually, we were the gold. Uh, so, we have so our objectives we're going to review three types of hazards associated with surgical smoke. That's the common nomenclature, some people call it flow. We're going to discuss measures to, to protect our perioperative uh, nurses and techs and patients and personnel. We're going to identify strategies to gain administrative support. We're going to outline steps to develop a smoke-free policy and describe the steps for implementation and change for smoke evacuation practices in our healthcare facilities. So, it's the time is now. We are at the tipping point. It is time to go smoke free. The real smoke in hospital, we're not in the hospital, we're not in the drug smoke in restaurants, but we are smoking human body parts. So the constituents as well as they are smoking. But we're also uh, 
smoking viruses and bacteria. Okay. So what about them? <laughs> Constituents of our electrosurgical smoke, our laser smoke, our ultrasonic, uh, that is created, they can turn to more than 50 leads of lung cancer, and smoking is linked to 15 types of cancer with over 30% of all cancer deaths. Well, lips and nose, they all suffuse in as you breathe, as we know, those chemicals, as you cough, come back up. In your lungs, as you inhale, they become filled with chemicals and carcinogens, and they fill the alveoli of the sacs and a lot of those chemicals, as well as diseases that are transmitted in the aerosolization. The stomach from the esophagus and the GI tract are bathed in these toxic chemicals. It moves through the bloodstream, guys, and smokers have a 60% more likelihood of stomach cancer. Why am I telling you all this? Because we know they're very, very similar. Okay? Pancreas, kidneys, bladder, they're very, very sensitive. They're carried to all three of those organs. Pancreas absorbs the toxins from the blood and the bile. The kidneys filter the substances and transfer the toxins to the urine. And the bladder is the number one risk of bladder cancer. The cervix, it potentiates the effects of human papillomavirus. The bone marrow chemicals in the bloodstream that affect where the white blood cells are affected and it raises the odds of leukemia. So we said that was then and this is now more doctor smoke, electrosurgical smoke than any other cigarette. But think about you guys. We're talking about like this. You're in there, obviously. You're in there seven days a week. You're in the whole month of your days. The week that you work, your higher your exposure is so much higher. So uh, the message is universal: no smoking in the operating room. And one of the things I did years ago, I'm going to say that was 30 years ago, when when Buffalo was the uh, the primary smoke evacuation companies at that time. And I remember this: Would you say? And then, of course, in my young years as a neuroscientist, I was very much involved in the concerns of laser forces. And I can remember us talking about surgical smoke, i.e., laser smoke, and these are standards very specific about that during that course. And I'm going up to one of the surgeons teaching, and I said, Well, you know, I'm going to do this. You know, the delivery of the lady smoke on the east delivery of laser delivery. And he goes, Vanjie, there's no such thing as safe smoke. So that is not the protection of the So I'm giving it to you. There is no such thing as safe smoke. The side effects of the laser and the laser is that you remember it 
any heat generated in oxygen. Why surgical smoke? What did OSHA say? And that number is probably huge now. Over 500,000 healthcare workers are exposed to surgical smoke and bioaerosols each year. And 50% of operating room personnel have some sort of respiratory issues associated with smoke. Okay, well, let's research, and this is back in 2017, research was done on that same uh, model, I mean, that same research study. When you take a look at the case PhD studies, you looked at allergies, sinus infections, asthma, and bronchitis. Look at the percentages of, that were prevalent in that study. Pretty significant. And so it's well, you did get one hand and then you just said the bottom line is I don't know what that point of allergies or cold set asthma, which I think is Well, it is similar to the difference in our set of so even though we don't maybe give up the answer, and nobody knows the whole truth because the Surgeon General has already published the direct correlation between cigarette smoke and, and lung cancer, but yet we know the smoke constituents are more concentrated in, in the devices that we use in the operating room. Perioperative nurses from the K-Ball Dr. Ball study have twice the incidence of some sort of arrest. In 1998, CDC published guidelines for environmental control of our health care. The research is out there. They said that there's two types of airborne contaminants, splatter and droplets. We know that can aerosol in the room and settle back on our gowns, and it re-enters the drain. Re 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 now, the other aerosols are produced by heat-generated devices. Those are examples of lasers and electrosurgery. They can remain in the air up to 20 minutes. What do we do with COVID? We, we look at the air exchanges in our room and that dictated when we were able to move out of that room. When that could go, and then move into terminal. Uh, I always tell a story um, at a meeting I was in a business meeting. And uh, my newsletter got there at the time called Black Lady. 
some of the, the studies that NIOSH put out. And for those of you that are over 40 and can't see this, I blew it up a little bit. Yes. <laughs> and I have to look at it too, but look at the bottom. Smoking has unpleasant foods, has mutagenic potential, as Holly said in her um, opening remarks. And what it does it say? So you can use Studies. I'm not going to uh, go into detail, but basically it's some of the same thing. And what about your commission? A uh, war? Well, you have not seen it on your leg. You're walking in the environment of care, but we have gone much further now. But take a look at that. It says no hazards and vapors included, but not limited to, and it goes on to say glutaraldehyde. Um, and other vapors such as carter rising quick. And then uh, let me commend a uh, letter for the publication and helping us get the word out to Joint Commission. I am not Joint Commission with MF Health. I am DMV. And when the surveyors came about three weeks ago, you know what they said when they walked into the operating room? What are you doing about smoke evacuation? We had our policy, we had our conversion, and our so very, very thankful for the voices of of what you know, getting there and being at the patients who do not have a There's a list of the So recommend the practices. We've got joint commission, the environment of care. ANSI has been out there since 1988. We knew there was no such thing as safe smoke. I highlighted it. LGAT, laser general, the very broken contaminants, but you will say no, the surgical devices are used in conjunction with it. Yeah, that's the professional organizations are here to be able to do those resources. They are regulated in Canada. They are regulated in the industry right now. Our industry is a lot of things for a lot of places. We are so far behind. The time is now for conversion. And then very, very proud of our guidelines. The smoke, uh, our smoke guidelines actually was pulled out. We felt like there wasn't enough information. And they are in our guidelines came out in 2017 for smoke. So facts that you probably already know. Four to six hours in the operating room, 27 to 30 cigarettes, one gram of tissue vaporized by an electric surgical unit that says put on the smoke and sit on the cigarettes. Now, let me go to the One And as we said earlier, operating room personnel had twice the incidence of some type of respiratory situation because of the exposure. Now, what is smoke? It is a vaporization of tissue. We know that. We don't really because we have been doing it for years. It's human body parts. It's job is not for EDS We're smoking people, guys. And if I had to charge you with what's the it, it's going to be by constitutional law if you're not using smoke evacuation. And this is my problem. It's polarized tissue. It's blood. It's viruses. It's, it's all kinds of things. So you're breathing in blood, right? And if you take a look at the uh, the combination of the contents of food, 95% is fluid or water, 
and 5% is the bulk of the particulate matter, the organic gases, the inorganic, with over 140 different chemicals, depending on what we search for. So 95% water vapor. Not everybody goes, well, it's not hot. No, it's not, but it acts as a carrier. That's what creates that velocity in the operator. And these are some examples of all the chemicals that is contained in smoke. I could have done two pages of that there. It's just a FYI, we can go into detail there if you want to. But take a look at the particulate size and where it goes in your all right, so we're talking at a 0.3 micron is lung damaging dust, right? And for particulates, can, at that small, 0.3 micron, microns can enter deep into the alveoli of the lungs. They cross the blood barrier into the lymphatic system. That's when we talk about leukemia. And yes, the particulates can cross the placenta barrier. What was So this was just a real eye opener to me. Counts, the particulate counts for an incisional hernia, hernia repair is 292,000 per cubic centimeter. Liver resection, this is what you're breathing in the air, is 490,000 409, cubic centimeters. And the average tidal volume when you take a deep breath is 500 cc. In few breath at the surgical field and remote field, you have approximately breathed in 146 million particles per breath. And that's 7% of those are 0.3 And the smaller the particle, the further it can travel. So take a look at these heat generated devices. Electrosurgery is the smallest and massive device we use almost 90 something percent of our cases, right? So you're breathing in probably um, more on electrosurgery and it's traveling further in the room as attested by a radiologist that ran out of the reading room because we were burning something up. When they were in place when I was getting a calculator there, we take a look, one kilojoule neodymium glass rod laser is vaporizing a projectile of particulates of over 5,000 feet per second. And some of the infrared photography, I don't know if I put it in this lecture, you can see once you move the evacuation tubing within four to six inches away from the site of capture, it is aerosol remote five to six feet in the room. So if we don't think the circulator has exposure, most likely, yes, they do. But take a look at this velocity. Person standing from the feet can inhale as much smoke as a surgical team. Within five seconds, there's millions of particles. It travels at 40 miles per hour, increasing the baseline from 60,000 particulates to 1 million. 1 million. And it takes how long for the OR to go down the baseline levels? Because I think we got that when we did the presentations. They said, well, the air exchanges in the room. What are we going to go? Ding, 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 ding. You both need to listen to the room. It doesn't matter. Seventy-seven percent of these we've been doing the research as early as 1975. They're 1.9 microns. I just want to do some sensational impact, but that's a virus. It's kind of like those big bugs, viruses you don't see. That's a virus. Not around respects. Again, they have problems from all the particulate matter. You know, we talked about dizziness, eye irritations, absorption of the soft contact lenses. All these things can happen. And you know, what you can't see can't hurt you. That's not true either. I did put the infrared photography in there. And let me, let me share with you. There's the blue arrow. That's the smoke you can see. Now, as we start pulling away, you can see a little of a light color around it. The darker image is the smoke you can see. And that around it is the smoke you can't see. Let's pull a little further back. We're about four inches away, and you can see that. But look at the last slide, about six inches from the start of the impact. Look at the crystallization that occurs there. And of course, it's real important in the devices that you set up. They've got to create a vortex for a minute. And you just can't clamp it on there and expect to a back You're only as good as your ability to do that. I'll give you a chance to get off your 
Case studies, this was a 53-year-old uh, male gynecologist, HPV virus. He's uh, been exposed to over 3,000 cases in 20 years, uh, developed uh, a HPV-16. That is the same condylomial virus that is in the literature, HPV-16. Another one, another gynecologist felt something in the back of his throat. Take a look. Uh, there, the base of the tongue revealed a squamous cell carcinoma. Again, HPV-16. And again, another biological cross. This was from a nurse showing her her, her scan. Dr. Mark Talamonte uh, diagnosed with pulmonary sarcoidosis, no risk factors, and he believes it's a direct correlation from being exposed to surgical smoke. And of course, um, uh, you know, so sad to hear that uh, Dr. Henley died uh, recently. I think he died from sarcoidosis early from what I understand. So there's a lot. So do you practice standard precautions? Is there a smoke evacuator in every patient? That's what we have to look at. Look at your thoughts. I have right now in every single one, including in the automatically protecting the And I'm smoke evacuators the GI. This is the general smoke. The AGDs and the whole hospitals, right? Well, my neck chance, because I can't use big smoke Every single one. Uh, and, but keep in mind, it's only as good as its cubic foot okay. And then when you look at wall suction, as they said, well, you can just use wall suction to look at the full wall suction, two cubic foot per minute versus smoke evacuators and the That's why we use smoke evacuators probably for the game of Smaller balloon, not as effective. I remember Peggy Sand, names not changed to protect the innocent. She put 16 foot cast iron for suction to the level of the tubing on small evacuator to reduce the cast. That's great. So, as soon as possible, long as soon as possible, So, Abraham did a pilot study. What was the most popular method for evacuating smoke? No filtration. Endoscopic smoke affects our patients. What did Sages say? They all of a sudden changed their position standing in the COVID. Oh, yeah. Well, that also, not just the loss of visibility, but there's a happens to our patients. This is what we do after surgery. Isn't that what we do? So, what happens is the, the smoke accumulates in the abdominal cavity of our patients and it bonds with hemoglobin faster than oxygen does. And its byproducts are met hemoglobin, which is all the signs and symptoms of carbon monoxide. Now, we're not exceeding those levels, but they get non-specific abdominal pain, head, nausea, and vomiting, everything that we blame on anesthesia. And then Dr. Mason says, What are you telling me? I've got to. I'll start uh, not using the OD at all during the laparoscopy, and I went no. But we need to continuously try to uh, maintain the pneumoperitoneum while vacuum evacuating the plume that is generating the okay. Look at the CO2 production 345 parts per million after five minutes, and at the end of one procedure, 475, and the EPA levels for one hour exposure is only 35. That's what we're doing to our patients, too. We don't want to do that, right? The masks. Oh my gosh, I'm talking my husband's here in the car to start a mask. The mask was designed to protect the patient from you, not you from the patient. That's why we're wearing our mask to protect you from me, right? And that came out a long time ago with the ANSI standards. High filtration masks are great for residual particulates, um, but Basically, they do not protect us. They are not your first line of defense. Dr. Brown, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going and I don't know about you, but I never want my hair messed up, so I roll over my ears underneath there. And now we got all of us wearing these procedure masks. 
that have gates all in there. Um, I actually uh, had a horrible time in Puerto Rico. Uh, but they would always say that the technology that is occurring has shown that masks were effective after 30 minutes. But yet, prior to COVID, we and UT docked them in their back pocket, hanging from their neck, and going to the room, and then going back to the So, smoke evacuation. Just, just be a, you know, do a great assessment and figure out what fits the culture in your operating. Make sure that we're not exposing ourselves on the removal of filters. Consider the biopass. Consider. Make sure that the suction pull is adequate enough that you always turn it down as you can turn it. We want a lot of that. And what I want from my smoke evacuation is the ability to activate the smoke evacuator when the low E was activated. And what that does is it allows us to listen to our music a little better. But there are much more wide. You can still hear it. So there's different adapters. You want to put it on the dog. So I have to see what's on how to set up the practice for evaluation. We take talks, we dedicate, we get gap analysis, we get everything. Excuse me, according to the goals here. We even, most of our docs, 50% of them use open tubing. They just talk to tubing. And these are other types of situations that you can hook up if you don't have insufflators that uh, will provide the, the evacuation uh, methodology or, or uh, characteristic on the machines. Safety, patient safety. Uh, if you look at the gases across the placental barrier, we know that baby's first breath in a C section is surgical smoke. Monitored anesthesia care. Patients are breathing their own body parts. Implementation considerations. We know postoperatively in research that this kind of stuff was actually shown in patient urine before and after with smoke evacuation. Risk management, evidence, and documents support benzene, possible legal risk, and transitional changes in surgery. What did I say is the biggest thing that we have to change now? We have neutrals and free hats. We use personal protective equipment. Now is the time to evacuate surgery. So, no smoking in the opera. Data, everybody's having a moment. How do you implement this? It's the $50 million question. Basically, that must be measurable. You still have to do a financial analysis. You need to involve your administrative committee, your safety committee, your infection control. Remember, we did that when we first launched it. All these people need to be involved. They're going to be advocates. And they were shocked back then. That was in the early 90s. I can't believe this. Right? This was my master's program, actually, my abstract. I believe the first step in developing a smoke evacuation program is by protecting the healthcare workers, is that the entire surgical team must be involved in the conversion. I did my PICO statement. I'm not going to read that to you, basically, but it sets a sequence of events for that. And then a simple bullet sequence for implementation and how I was able to go smoke free for five different medical centers. Administrative support. I did my homework first. I chose physician, surgical tech, and nurse champions. We did a gap analysis with a pretest to evaluate their knowledge based on smoke, and most of them failed, to be honest with you. We educated staff and surgeons. We also broke bread and drank at Earl Street in Anderson, South Carolina. We did this and had Kay and Brenda come up and teach because I felt like you're not a prophet in your own backyard. Let's bring some experts in from the outside. We did evidence based resource manuals. We did a tabletop. We wanted them to look at it before they used it, and then they tell us what they wanted, and we worked specifically with the specialty coordinators. Inline filters, point on, on every wall suction in there. We set some skills assessment with a go live day. Um, we went live. We monitored the practices. We did a post test, which everybody ace, obviously, right? And we continued with our compliance monitors because we didn't want to drop the ball three to six months later. And again, so what about compliance? Am I talking my talk? There is a policy implementation, the skills assessment that I just spoke of, 
signage everywhere. It was all over the place. We reviewed and followed up and validated, and there is my uh, data right there. As you can see, P PDCA, we were at 100% compliance. That's how we won both. So you can't expect what you can't inspect. That's why concurrent monitors, just like hypothermia, needs to continue. So we implement, we do a culture change. If they don't think anything up, if they ask the question, just like they said, we're going to where do I smoke? So implementation practices, what was my biggest uh, obstacle with our surgeons? They said, don't interrupt surgery. You have to interrupt the rhythm in the culture of surgery. When you start interrupting surgery, we forget that's why we visit the end. So these are some photos of different ways that we hooked up. As you can see, that was neurosurgeon, that was our neurosurgeon. They pulled back. They said, you can't go in there. This was at one at that time. I said, why? Dr. Wood, do you remember Dr. Wood? Do you remember Dr. Wood? Oh, nobody remembered Dr. Wood. He developed that. He wanted us to make it a two man. Well, he was trying to put the plant on the end of it, punch holes, put it off the way and activate it. And what it is, it's 20, but it was just a 20% of the kids smoking away. So, okay. Uh, John Collar says there's eight steps for change management. We know that. And basically, it is increase the urgency, build a team, embrace a vision, guys, communicate the buy in, and then empower people. Don't let up and make it sick. Build a clear who is smoking, what is smoking, and Georgia needs to be red. And that's why we're here today. We're here for advocacy. We've got to make it red. And next year is the year to do it. Absolutely. See no evil, hear no evil, it smell no evil. Okay? Because the bottom line, if you can smell what you're doing in the operating room, you are not looking at the damage. What does that mean? Some of us say, however, if you want to talk about stage, you've got to be the same. And in hindsight, it may be so cavalier about the attitudes to surgical smoke, not the worst of the best smoke. And there's nothing like what you're looking at to spur a big change. Now, Joe, did you say you're going to come up? Yes. So, in summary, we are going to reduce our habit. Oh, yeah, come on up. And change management is important. Really? So, okay. <laughs> Asking how I knew my love for the old was true. I found a something here to try, and I believe in my Hey, sexy guy, you're fine. You may end up wrong again. When the future matters, you must realize focus in your eyes. So I check and then I go and slip to think that I'm a will. He had to take me my eyes to burn and sting. I am without all my atheist to me. Now, as I circulate and try to look I just cry my when the body Spoken in your 
<laughs> okay, uh, we want to go on record right now and say uh, Christopher, Doreen, and I have a program submission submitted for uh, Fort New Orleans. So if it gets accepted, it is on smoke, and uh, maybe you can be there. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, you heard last night that Joe is the uh, president elect of Augusta chapter. That was one of our road trips, our smoke buster road trips this year. And Eileen Bach is here also. She is the current president. And uh, I failed to introduce her last night, so I wanted to make sure that you all uh, talk to Eileen and uh, Augusta uh, University Hospital in Augusta after we were down there doing the smoke evacuation program, started their evaluation, and they're on the road to go clear. So congratulations. But my dream would be that every nurse who works in the operating room becomes as impassioned and as uh, committed as Vanji is, and so many more of you are, to making sure that we clean up the atmosphere. So it's time for a break. Uh, please go visit the vendors and thank them once again for being here with us and be back in this room at 945 to start again and thank you all very much. <laughs>